Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Five Features. Uh, today we're joined with a really special guest, someone who knows a lot about uh, Big Five basketball and just basketball in general. Um, he's a national championship coach at the D3 level with Rowan, um, coached at Maine before spending 14 years as LaSalle's head coach uh, from 2004 to 2018, highlighted by an electric uh, Sweet 16 March Madness run. Dr. John Giannini. John, how are you doing? Thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Doing great. Happy to talk uh, Philly Big Five basketball. Definitely. Yeah, and um, I'd be remiss not to sort of start with uh, the news that kind of broke last week and sort of took Philly by storm. Um, there was an article by Laura or sorry Dana O'Neill um, of the Athletic that sort of highlighted a new plan um, in motion for the Big Five this year. That one that would include Drexel as part of the City Six and uh, sort of a, a new tournament style that would actually end up culminating at the Wells Fargo Center and to much people's uh, chagrin, not the Palestra. So I want to know sort of your initial thoughts on that idea. I know um, some coaches have said, uh, you know, the programs have said it themselves that there wasn't much communication about this and, you know, that's not necessarily finalized plan. Uh, so I want to get your initial thoughts on that start up front. Well, there's been communication about this for about six years. So yeah. I, I don't, any of the coaches are really that surprised. The Big Five has been diminished. We could talk about the reasons for that. I feel very badly about it. I don't think it was necessary. I think it could come back very strongly. Uh, but to do that, you need to create interest. And this tournament does it. Now, I can understand the Wells Fargo for the championship Saturday, but other games have to be in the Plestra. The Big Five and the Plestra are synonymous. A uh, split house in the Plestra is what the Big Five was built on. And I think the reason the Big Five has been diminished is, I don't think I know it for certain, is that that model was gotten away from. Uh, games were moved out of the Plestra and great rivalries with great tradition and incredible atmosphere became like any other game on the schedule. And once yeah. that happens, you lose the specialness. Yeah, and um, I was talking to Mike Jensen about this, and he's he had an idea sort of that, the real key to sort of maybe why some of the appetite has been lost for the big five in the city was really just the levels of talent have been a little bit down in the last couple of years. Oh, Is that a big factor? Oh, they go together. When I'm telling you in terms of local recruiting in, I'll give you a story about Ruben Glando, who was a good player for us and was highly, highly recruited for our standard. He had a couple power five offers and uh, frankly, he wanted to see who else was going to recruit him. And he was playing at St. Pat's under Kevin Boyle on a great team. And he was a 6'5", versatile point guard. And uh, his, his plan was to make us recruit him for what I thought was forever. I get his point of view, but it was a two-year process. He went to one St. Joe's LaSalle game in front of 9,000 people and committed immediately afterwards. Kids want to play in front of 9,000 people going crazy. Playing in front of half-empty gyms, not so much. And yeah. I think that, the, that there's a lot of factors for the, the, the decrease in local talent. But one of the factors is definitely that the Big Five doesn't have that local um, respect. Uh, when you play in front of 9,000 people in that atmosphere, people are excited. And why you wouldn't want to do that is, frankly, hard for me to understand. Well, I yeah. get the point of views of different schools, and I think that they cut off their nose to spite their face. They played at home to get more wins or got more revenue. or uh, But in the end, they made something very special a lot less special. Yeah. Yeah, I think people are definitely like sort of uh, very vocal about their displeasure with the, the palestra element of it um, in specific. But I was actually at the uh, St. Joe's LaSalle game on Sunday. I don't know if you were watching, but um, it was one of the most packed crowds I've seen for a St. Joe's game, maybe aside from a Vill the Villanova games that obviously they, their fans draw really well. But it was an electric atmosphere, and I haven't really experienced that or felt that in a few years. And, um, it was something like just felt really special in the place that there was some sort of momentum growth, obviously. LaSalle's had a year where they may be a little bit better than people may have thought. And St. Joe's just went on a win with, you know, five five wins out of six in a row. So that's where I kind of see, like, you know, that appetite kind of grows when the team started performing a little bit better on in the A-10 schedule specifically. I agree. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so basically uh, I really wanted to uh, 
get into sort of uh, where your your interest for coaching came. Um, specifically, I know you're going back a while and you've coached for a really long time and had a lot of success in a lot of different areas. Um, but where was sort of that initial inkling for you to maybe that this could be a career for you? I know you're a grad assistant at uh, Illinois. Yeah, Illinois. Yeah. North Carolina. I think it's the same for all of us from our era. We couldn't get enough of it. We loved it. Uh, there was nothing. And to this day, I will say that there's no feeling in life like, you know, beating a nationally ranked Butler team in goal arena or some of the great Palestra games that we played. Yeah. I, I can't think of anything in life that matches that emotion, that excitement, uh, and also the human part of it to bunker down with uh, a group of 20 players, coaches and managers on the first day of school and to know that you're going to spend a year of your life together as a, a group, as a family, and that you are going to try to do something really hard, which is beat the other locker rooms full of 20 people with great coaches and great schools and great budgets and great mm -hmm. facilities. And you're all going to battle it out and you have to be all in like that. I, I'm, I, as much, I love education. I believe in education, but there's no classroom that gives you that feel. So I think that's why everyone in my era got into it. It's just, you can't find anything else like it. Yeah. And you're, and you're a guy who hails from Chicago, another great, uh, you know, prolific basketball city. What, how could you compare the two or maybe find some differences between Philadelphia as a city? So, and so, you have to understand my junior year in high school, three of my first five games were against Doc Rivers, Mark Aguirre, and Isaiah Thomas. <laughs> uh, Terry Cummings was a first or second round draft choice in that same era. Wow. Um, I played in the Chicago Catholic League, who, which is very comparable to the Philadelphia Catholic League, and that's really high praise. So yep. I think, I mean, to be diplomatic, but all so realistic i honestly do mean this it's kind of the midwest version of uh philly you know the chicago public league had king with great players like Ephraim winners and uh marcus liberty and the great Simeon teams a lot of them were at illinois when i was there uh, um you know nick anderson and uh ben thomas who, who, who tragically passed away um uh but yeah, I, I think uh, it, it would compare to Philly at its best, but just in the Midwest. Yeah. I, I was curious about sort of how like a big city like that with a lot of Oh, teams. I'm sorry, Ben Wilson. It's been okay. a while since I thought it was Ben Wilson. Yes. <laughs> so, so obviously, you know, we have this great tradition of Philly. Is there anything similar to that with Chicago in the college level where, you know, they got Northwestern? And Illinois? No, there's nothing like the big five nationally. That's why I'm, without exaggeration, angry that we – took something that literally no one else has. If you look at the other cities, no one except for LA has even close to the number of NCAA bids that the five teams in Philly do. And the only reason LA is even close is because of UCLA. Yeah. So this is completely unique. There's nothing else like it. Um, there's one game, uh, but it's not Chicago-based. Uh, the Illinois-Missouri border battle was pretty special. But that's one game and um, nothing like the Big Five. I, I, I could go into the reasons why people de-emphasized it, and I just really disagree with it. I think it's sad. Mm. And uh, so when you were sort of – when you were – you know, coming to Philly before you got there, did you have any sort of idea of the history? I know you're a student of the game, kind of. Did you did you know so, what it was? So this is I when it really, really hit me. And this is what's being lost generationally. When we were having success at Maine, and I, I had some opportunities, but I loved Maine very deeply. I yeah. was very emotional about leaving because I was happy and it was a great university and I loved the outdoors and we lived on a lake and my kids were happy and it was just a great time but yeah. I wanted to coach in a multi-bid league I had just coached in two of the last three championship games and it was one of those leagues where if you no matter what you do in the regular season if you don't win the championship game you didn't you weren't going to win yeah so I was very excited to come to the A-10 the A-10 at the time and it's you know this year's the exception it was a 
two to five bid league. Yep. So I was very excited about that. And it turned out the only reason we, one of the biggest reasons we made the Sweet 16 run is because of the strength of the league. And we were able to get a bid on the strength of the league. But I came to Philly excited about the Atlantic 10. And nobody congratulated me on being an A-10 coach. None of my coaches were <laughs> zero. They all couldn't believe, man, I can't believe you're a big five coach. Like, this is wow. it's unbelievable. And when you think about it, those guys grew up with uh, Dr. Jack Ramsey and, um, uh, you know, just from Tom Gola to Coach Cheney to Harry Litwack to Rolly Massimino. Yep. to uh, Lynham, to Jack McKinney. And, I mean, you're talking multiple NBA coaches, multiple Naismith Hall of Fame coaches. And once I realized that what that tradition meant and that I was coaching in something that at that time was held in such reverence and the footsteps I was following in, it it just was incredible. And, of course, there was the great Speedy Morris in there. Mm. Um, so... I found out pretty quickly. The problem is I'm not sure that the younger generations are going to have that reverence of the big five because we have taken, we have not created new memories. All those previous memories, frankly, were built on those split crowds in the palestra. And uh, it's very simple. When we got away from that, it became like anything else. All the memories now belong to Villanova in the last decade, right? Yeah, they have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, there, but also, their memories are based on the national level. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, we already talked about it. the other cities don't have anything like this. So here's a Jay Wright quote Jay, when he was the coach at Hofstra, I was the coach at Maine. We came in the same league and we came up kind of together until oh, wow. he catapulted beyond everybody. But they would do a charity function in New York and uh, the coaches would do it. And that would be the end of it. And he comes to Philly. And when we would do a coaches versus cancer shoot around at the car show, I think this was at the car show. And I think every TV news station was out there. And Jay said, I can't believe how big the big five is here. He said, <laughs> in New York, if it doesn't have to do with Derek Jeter or Madonna or <laughs> something like that, like no one's going to pay attention. So that's someone coming from New York where, frankly, and, and listen, I, I talked to the coaches at Boston College and Northeastern in Boston, and they said, you walk down the street there, no one knows who you are. You know, the big five coaches, when Phil Martelli or Fran Dunphy or Jay Wright walks down the street, everyone knows who they are. So no one else has that, or I should say had that to that degree. Yeah, and I actually uh, went back and heard you talk about this on another podcast. I believe it was like the uh, the A10, A10 podcast or something. Um, and you talked about, sort of how a lot of teams in the A-10, they are the premier, the preeminent show in town. They are the, the star of the show um, in some of these smaller areas where, you know, Dayton, for example, or, you know, George Mason or something, or uh, Davidson. Um, do you think some of the reasons why maybe that has, the, the Big Five has maybe diminished in rep representation a little bit is because sort of the success of maybe some of the other teams in Philadelphia or? No, no, I, I think it's, it's a couple things. First, and even more so than not marketing and promoting and uh, strengthening the big five tradition. And you, yeah. I clearly feel strongly about that. But even more so than that is the landscape of recruiting. Uh, recruiting now continues to become more and more different. Recruiting now, I think, uh, favors the schools that are away. I think kids want to get away. I think that the, the inner city struggles have something to do with kids wanting to, to move on. I mean, you look at major cities all over the country and gun violence is an issue. Yep. Uh, you look at uh, just without getting too much into the underbelly of yeah. reality of big time recruiting, uh, you know, sometimes there's more incentives to not stay at home, especially now with NIL. So I, I do think it's more than, you know, what the how the big five has been treated, the landscape is getting more and more difficult, which to me makes it all the more imperative to make games special and to maximize your local excitement. 
Yeah, and I, and I actually spoke to Tyreek Duran, a player you're obviously really familiar with, a uh, great guy, well-spoken guy, knows a lot about the game. Um, and I sort of asked him about the challenges of recruiting um, in the Big Five, and we've seen a lot less and less Philadelphia kids, you know, the premier talent in this in the city, commit to, um, you know, the Big Five schools than we have in the past. And he pretty much you nailed exactly what he said, basically, about, you know, choose between Miami or, or LaSalle. I mean – what's the choice there if you can get out of the situation that you're currently in right now and sort of start fresh um, as a coach, what sort of challenges did, did you, did you sort of face when you were in, in terms of recruiting people to LaSalle um, in the city, especially the kids who are in the mix here? Well, you know, I, I think some of those are obvious. I, I think that uh, first we'll talk about the pluses. I think I had a great staff and I think I, I had a, uh, uh, well, I know. I mean, LaSalle's tradition is amazing. The league is amazing. Um, and the people are terrific. And the education's phenomenal. I, I, every kid I had liked being at LaSalle. They felt cared for. The faculty was pro-student. So there's a zillion positives. But I would frankly tell recruits, if you want substance, a good education, people who will help you grow as a player and as a student and have a blast during your college experience and go to school in a great city and play in a great league, you should come here. If you're looking for nice stuff, don't come here because we don't have nice stuff. Nothing. Yeah. I said, we don't have anything nice. And I wasn't, <laughs> but uh, kids want stuff. And I'm not just talking about basketball players. I'm talking about students. They want fancy dorms. They want big TVs. They want swimming pools. They want rec centers and they want, uh, places to sunbathe when the weather gets nice. And, you know, in inner city schools and in LaSalle situation, you, you don't have any of those things. So that, I would say those were the challenges. Definitely. Um, so I want to sort of go back to what you were talking about, sort of coming to the Big Five and how uh, you came oh, into the Hold on. I, I have to back back. When I oh, said swimming pools, I met beautiful outdoors. We, we have a swimming pool within Gola that uh, people uh, love to talk about. So I have to clarify the swimming pool issue. We got that in our <laughs> basketball facility, which not a lot of people have. But I met, you know, uh, like I said, when I was in GA at Illinois, they had an outdoor pool. And it just goes back to the nice stuff thing. But uh, I wanted to catch myself because the Gola pool is legendary. Yeah, now they got the, what do they got, the smoke machine or the fog machine there? Yeah, well? it's all great. <laughs> I think that's a blast. Yeah, no, it's it's a blast, and I see those guys on Twitter. Uh, the uh, Gola Standard, they do a really fun job uh, talking about that kind of stuff. But so yeah, I, I wonder those, really, those are really they're really funny guys. What's that, yeah. Joe? Yeah, so I want to sort of go back to when you sort of came to the Big Five. Were you at any point maybe taken aback by some of like the media attention that you were receiving in the in the role? As as far as like you said, no. I, one of the things that I was really lucky to do. Is I was at G8 North Texas, and that was a great experience. Joe Dumars and Carl Malone won the Southland Conference then, and I got Division One experience and, yeah. and worked under some wonderful coaches. Uh, but then I went to Illinois. So, you know, I, when yeah. we were number one in the country in Final Four and were covered by the Chicago media. So I, I, I never was nervous talking to people, and I've been around a lot of cameras and big arenas because of the Illinois experience. So, uh, yeah, that didn't phase me. And I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed being in a place where people cared about basketball. Yeah, that's that's part of the, that's, that's part of the job. And then uh, one thing I was, I was very curious about, um, you don't get many basketball coaches with a PhD uh, on the show. And I, I was just sort of curious how that grind kind of worked for you as far as when you were coaching. So I, I wanted to be uh, the best sports psychologist in the world. As a basketball player, I was a small college guy. And I couldn't figure out why I loved it so much. I put too much pressure on myself. Uh, I don't think I played well at times. I'd lose confidence at times. Mm. So, and my undergraduate major was psychology. Once I found out there was such a thing as sports psychology, I said, that's what I want to do. And whether you call it fate or faith, I told you I wasn't ready to give up basketball. I cold called Tommy Noman, Duman, the coach at North Texas. Coaches hire First of all, they have, I'm not exaggerating, 
hundreds of people email every year say, I want to volunteer. I want to be a grad assistant. I want to get started. My dream is to be a college coach. And usually they hire someone that they know or someone that's close to someone they know. I cold called Tommy Newman as a Chicago kid. He's the coach at North Texas. He said, <laughs> one of my former players just got at another job, one of my GAs. He says, I'm looking for someone and I'm going to be in Chicago tomorrow morning. I mean, the, I could go <laughs> through that scenario a million times and that would never happen. Wow. So I got on the staff at North Texas and he, Tommy Newman, really mentored me. The best sports psychology doctoral program in the country at that time was at University of Illinois. And that was my goal. And I recruited Coach Henson for three years. And uh, everything I wanted to do, I got the chance to do. Uh, the, the, and then after getting my PhD and being at North Texas and Illinois for a combined five years, I realized I couldn't stay in Division One because I had all GA experience and no recruiting experience. So I knew no one was going to hire me to be a, an assistant at the Division One level without recruiting experience. So I applied for every Division Two and Three job in the country. I decided I did not want to go to, into, into academia because I, I love coaching so much. Mm. And the first school to hire me was Glassboro State, which is now Rowan. And that started my head coaching career. So it's unorthodox. Wow. Most people work themselves up as assistants. I did the grad assistant thing into a small college thing into a head coaching thing. Wow, that's a story there. I didn't know that. And um, it seems it seems like a great marriage. Obviously, I don't know if that was intentional by you. Um, I'm, I'm sure it was. Obviously, you said you love basketball and you were already sort of on that track. But how much of that stuff and uh, sort of directly related to you as a coach and how your what your philosophy was as far as um, you know trying to get the best out of your guys and making sure they're confident on the right path. Completely. I, completely. I studied under some of the best sports psychologists in the world at Illinois and at North Texas. I thought about these issues. I was passionate about them. I wrote about them. I did research on them. I was prepared to go into a faculty position to do research and teach sports psychology and to consult people on it. Uh, so, uh, but this is what I would say. Every coach is a good sports psychologist. I just, because I thought about it so much and I was around so many good people, I think I, rather than learning through trial and error, I actually was able to learn uh, from being around people and being educated in the field. And I and it helped me immensely as a young head coach at Glassboro State slash Rowan. It, it, that was a really big deal. So I don't think it helped me as much much later in my career because Fran Duffy and Jay Wright and Phil Martelli and, and Stevie Donahue and Jerome Allen, they're, they know how to motivate to trust me and they know how to get people focused and they know how to bond a team. Mm. But I think early in my life, I was uh, ahead of schedule on those things because of my background. Yeah. And obviously you're a person who's um, so entrenched in academia, even to this day, but I think even you would sort of say that there's nothing quite like, you know, all the studies that you get, there's nothing quite like that firsthand experience that can bring out, you know, some of the stuff you learned and really put it into light. Uh, you, you're exactly right. The, the, the theory to practice is a big jump and coaching allowed me to do that. Definitely. And then one thing I wanted to touch on was um, you may have a different opinion on this, but I think there's maybe potentially no more, never been a time and now where there's maybe more stress and as and, and pressure on young college basketball players and we're mixing your experience coaching and your experience in academia, um, you know, between gambling stuff that's now taking place at a commercialized level. Um, you know, there's people, you know, a lot of coaches this year have talked about sort of the social media abuse that players have been receiving because of stuff like gambling or like, you know, they didn't hit my line or, or whatever. And there's also obviously – um, this now NIL NIL situation that has tremendous consequences um, on on some of the stuff that you know this guy's getting paid more than me. Um, I I need to start doing this to make this amount of money. Talk about sort of maybe the, some of the humongous challenges that that those those elements sort of bring on. Joe, I, I want <laughs> your, your audience to rewind and just listen to what you said because you said it even better than me. The number of stressors they have is extraordinary. Uh, Tyreek Duran and I were at Jarrell Wright's wedding a year and a half ago, and we were talking about this, and Tyreek really lamented 
the situation of all the pressures that they have. And even the opportunity to make money, it sounds great and it is great and it's not going anywhere. Uh, and I think there's ways to do it that might be better than is what's being done right now. And the kids could still share in the revenue, but it could be a little bit more um, uh, structured uh, because right now the pressures on coaches and kids to literally find money and get money. I think there's money there that kids can get without, uh, you know, the, the heavy hand of trying to make believe that some college kid is going to sell Mercedes or some college basketball player is going to sell pizzas. Zion Williamson can. I don't think vi very few other athletes have the market presence yeah. to, to generate profits for some big company. It's just to hook kids up for recruiting. And that's not what it's really meant to be. So I do think they should get the revenue. And another talk, I could talk about how we could help kids more financially. But Tyreek's point is we just had a blast playing basketball. We didn't have to worry about sponsorships. We didn't have to worry about gambling. The social media criticism was far less so. Um, so the mental health issues are huge. And I feel bad because kids right now playing college basketball think that should I leave my school right now is a normal thought. They think should I be getting more money is a normal thought. They think should I lash out at these people who are attacking me is a normal thought. And for 40, 50 years, kids just had a blast playing college basketball. They had mm -hmm. the best time of their lives. And I, I'm, I'm not so sure, sure right now these kids are having the unbridled joy and relatively pure experience the kids were having. Uh, I still think you could have that joy and purity and be able to share in the revenue in a completely different model. And that's an interesting perspective that people don't necessarily always bring up um, is sort of that aspect of the players and how they're sort of dealing with that kind of thing and how it actually works out on paper. Because I think for years, for decades, people have had this discussion about athletes being paid the issue was how do we do it in a way that's uh, okay we, we may all agree that the athlete should be paid but how do, how do we do here's it? what should happen in my opinion yeah here's how i believe it should happen and i'm sure there's a lot of things i don't understand why it could not be so yep. when we have jobs people put money aside for our retirement i, I believe that every player should get a share of the ncaa revenue of course you got to decide what the formula is and maybe everyone gets something, but teams that advance in the tournament and generate more money, or maybe there's even a, a uh, some kind of institutional revenue sharing thing. But I believe that that should go into an account. And you're not paid while you're playing, but the day you leave school, you have a choice to either access that money or let it continue to be invested and grow. And anyone who knows how the how how compounding interest works if you take tens of thousands or a couple hundred of thousands of dollars for a 22 year old and let that stay invested for 20 30 years that's a big deal and where my heart breaks for kids is the ones who generate revenue and under the old system the coaches made money the schools made money but now maybe they fall on hard times and they don't have anything to show for it. Under my model, okay, if they took the money out of college, they would have something to show for it. But if they let it grow, I mean, they could be a long way towards having a great retirement based on what they did as an 18 to 22 year old. That That's what I would do. And I would set some money aside. I would invest it for them and they could have access however they deem is best for them once they leave college. That sounds like a great idea. How do we get this up to the courts? I'm sure there's a problem with it, and it's more complicated than that. But then, you know, they're they're listen, they're still getting full scholarship. They're getting cost of attendance and a Pell Grant. So if you're a student in need, your cost of attendance gives you your trips home, your holiday money, your pizza money, and your Pell Grant money takes it a little bit further beyond that. And remember, at the A10 level now, the, the, the food's pretty good. I mean, most of these places have a catered meal. Uh, 
a couple times a day. It's all you could eat. You could bring food back with you. You know, the days of players being hungry in the middle of the night, frankly, uh, at the A-10 level, you could bring home a, a bag full of food after eating all you can after a lot of these catered meals. So that that's what I would do. I, I want them to share in the revenue. I want kids to be okay. I want, um, yeah, and I think there's a way to do it. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. That's a really interesting point. I actually really like that idea. Um, it's with everything like this. It takes it will take probably twenty years to enact something like that, I guess. But uh, seemingly, but uh, uh, what's, what's something? This is kind of a random question. But what's something that um, is maybe underrated or under the radar of a really difficult challenge as a coach that people don't think about? Oh, I did hear the last part. An underrated challenge to do what? Of a coach that people wouldn't necessarily think about, like a task that or something that's part of a weekly or daily op operations as a coach that's incredibly like challenging or difficult that people wouldn't necessarily think about very little is under your control emotions of your players and if they have a death of someone close to them or they get injuries uh or they're struggling in school because they might have a hard major but they want to have that major or maybe they're in a relationship that doesn't go great Mm -hmm. um, or maybe they work really hard, but there's just someone a little bit better than them. And now they're depressed because they're not playing after they work so hard. And that's to say nothing of losing close games and the bounce of a ball and officials calls. And maybe a kid makes a bad decision off the court and gets in some trouble. <laughs> the, so I get it. Everything is a coach's fault, like literally everything. Because if something goes wrong and maybe a kid makes a mistake, they're not, well, then why did you recruit them? Or if nothing's obviously wrong, it's, well, you recruited them. Why can't you coach them better? So, and listen, at that level, coaches are well compensated. I, I would embrace the pressure. I don't mind the stressor. The pre no, 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 none of the coaches mind the stress or the pressure or criticism. Just living in a world where you have complete accountability and not that much control. It, it's tough to to manage yourself uh, and frustrations at times. So people talk about teams that get lucky, like, like our Sweet 16. We won close games. We had good players, and oh, mm. we got lucky. Well, what about all the years we got unlucky? What about when we had four seniors who were thousand point scorers coming back and adding a top fifty recruit in the country, and three of those scorers have have serious injuries. Yeah. You know, what about the year before the Sweet 16 where you lose in overtime at Villanova and lose in overtime against Temple? Uh, so, listen, I never apologize for good luck. Uh, people want to just say oh, they were lucky. They don't recognize the lack of control. And a lot of the times you've recruited a good team and you have good kids and good players and you have bad luck. So I'm not going to apologize for good luck because you've got to take the heat for the bad luck. Definitely. Yeah, you can't you can't blame me for that. And obviously, yeah. I wanted to get get to that at some point about sort of the, this that great run, uh, March Madness. So, um, well, so what was maybe some something behind the scenes, or maybe a funny story about that trip, or just something that people wouldn't get from the um, from the from the television? Because you know, we're watching here in Philly, we're watching everyone from Temple, St. Joe's. You know, we're really, we're rooting for LaSalle. We're, we want them to see you know have a great and it's a great story that year. So, so we had uh, and there's nothing. No earth-shaking story or pivotal moment. Yeah. I, I would say besides really good players, the key was our player leadership. And we had two players with very different leadership styles. So Ramon Galloway had extreme drive and emotion and was very verbal and could get after guys and could inspire guys and could give guys confidence. Uh, Tyreek Duran, when the floor is shaking with 20,000 people, when it's the last possession of the game, Tyreek Duran was the opposite. He gave incredible poise and was never rattled. So between the two of them, when we needed energy and emotion, there was remote. When we needed to calm down and gather ourselves, there was Tyreek. So it's interesting. You could talk about basketball and having a good big guy and a good guard and an inside outside game or good 
two-way players, good on offense, good defense. But for leadership between Ramon and Tyreek, we we had the ideal combination. We had the fiery, emotional, competitive guy with the guy who will never be rattled and always have poise. And I just think that those two guys always gave us whatever we needed at that moment. And, of course, Steve and Terrell were terrific big guys, and DJ Peterson was a great glue guy, and Sam Mills was – strong and quick and could defend against anyone and Tyrone Garland was one of the quickest players I've ever seen and made our team quickness between Ramon, Tyreek, Sam and and Tyrone collectively the quickness of those four players was extraordinary and Steve and Jarrell and Rohan Brown they wanted to be big guys they didn't want to run and round and shoot threes so we had the brawn inside and it just fit well together uh, but the mentally the, the, the personalities of Tyreek and Ramon were really special. Yeah, is it, I see as Tyreek is sort of like a game manager, like you sort of mentioned there. And I wanted to get your take on the uh, the Southwest Philly Flutter. What did you make of all that stuff, uh, sort of all the media attention there? And did you have a good, you guys have a good time with that? That's phenomenal. That's the pictures up on my, behind me over here. Oh, yeah. So it, it took two things. First, uh, the uh, great Sa Craig Sagan, the great NBA reporter. I mean, just beloved in the NBA. And almost anyone after that game would have asked Tyrone Garland, what play did they draw up? And what, what did, uh, um, you know, what did you see? What, how were they defending you? Uh, what does this mean for the school? What does this mean for you? It took someone with the personality of Craig Sager to ask none of that, but to ask, <laughs> man, what do you call that shot? And then, of course, he asked the perfect guy, one of the best senses of humor, the best laughs, one of the <laughs> funniest people to be around, Tyrone Garland. And he says, man, that's the Southwest Philly Floater. So it's a combination of two of the most unique, fun personalities, both doing that, that interview. And if it wasn't Craig Sager, there'd be no Southwest Philly floater. And if it wasn't for Tyrone's personality, you'd never call it the Southwest Philly floater. And I would tease him. I said, Tyrone, it's called a layup. It's <laughs> not, that wasn't a floater. That was a layup. And we would laugh about it. But it was a great shot. He actually shot it over at the time, the career leading shot blocker in the history of the SEC. And he did have to float it over this guy. Yeah. But it's an iconic shot and a great moment. And I, Great, happy for the school, our team, and for Tyrone to deservedly go down in Philadelphia basketball lore with that historic shot. Yeah, and that's what March Madness is all about. That's what college basketball is all about. We want to watch the best players in the world. We watch the NBA, right? We want to we live for those moments in college basketball. I speak for myself, but I think a lot of fans feel that way too. Yeah, no question. Okay, let's sort of last section here. I'll let you out of here soon, but. One question about obviously now um, you're at, you're an athletic director and you're involved in the communications at uh, um, Rowan University back where you started your coaching career, but you're also sort of involved in the broadcasting side of things. How did that come to play, and what were those initial discussions like for you sort of getting involved in the broadcasting and yeah. the media space? So first, I'm really fortunate that our, our president Rowan believed in letting faculty and staff be experts in their field. And if part of me being an expert means learning broadcasting and networking for myself and students and continuing to stay in touch with athletic directors and coaches across the country, president who feels that, it, that by doing work off campus and furthering our networks and our own abilities, and it just helps roll so I'm fortunate to have a job that allows me to do that. But as soon as I was not at LaSalle, it's the same thing as uh, when I was. Tongue twisted uh, is a challenge. Uh, I have to explain things in five to eight seconds. When I would, when a coach explains things to our team, we have unlimited time. We could mm. talk forever. <laughs> now I have to explain in five to eight seconds why a team is winning or losing or what the strategy is or what happened on the last play. And I don't want to be one of these captain obviouses and just say, yeah, that was a strong move. You know, I want to be able to show how the person got beat position and sealed 
and maybe it was the angle of the pass or a high low uh, or the defense wasn't in proper help position. I want to give analysis. Why did he get that move inside? Not just say, oh, he's strong. So I enjoy it, and I enjoy studying the game. I enjoy seeing my friends. This weekend, I'm going to see my buddy Mark Schmidt and my former player Sean Neal at St. Bonaventure go against Keith Dambra, who's a great guy at Pittsburgh. I'll probably go and, and have a beverage or two in in in, in Pittsburgh with uh, yeah. my producer friend, Matt Borzello. Uh, awesome. I'm watching, after we hang up right here, I'm watching the end of Dayton St. Bonaventure, seeing how Schmidt is working another miracle. So yeah. it's a blast. It's challenging. It's interesting. And, but the way I did it is I called everyone I knew, everyone that did one of my games, producers, play-by-play -play guys, uh, used relationships to get in charge of network uh, people who hire. I had some people give me a chance. And I, I the way I would – so it's I, – I enjoy it. Yeah, I want to do it as long as I can. Yeah, and I've 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 seen a lot of people on talking on Twitter that you know they they feel the same way. They love having you on. They say they get really happy when they see Dr. Giannini on the on the call or on the broadcast. So, yeah, people really enjoy you know your insights and um sort of we feel like you're a really fast learner in that in that space too, and you're doing really incredibly well. So, yeah, I, we I really I really try hard, Joe. And guess what? I haven't lost a game yet. From broadcasting, like the feeling you asked about the other things people don't realize. These coaches, coaches, they live this. And it's all summer, like a typical summer day now for an A10 coach is to be in and check in on your guys' weightlifting, then meet with your staff, go to breakfast and bond with your players, then talk with your staff about recruiting, then have an individual workout, then uh, or or a team practice, then go to lunch with the guys and Make sure they go to study hall in class. And and that's the offseason. So the amount – and they're well compensated, but that's not why coaches do it. But the amount of complete personal immersion that these coaches have, and mm. when you do that and you lose, it, it's literally viscerally painful. So these coaches that play it off and have a good front, they are dying inside. And I haven't felt like that. And I was privileged to wish I did it longer because it's a roller coaster and the joy is worth the pain. But uh, now that I just turned 60, it's nice just to have fun with basketball and not have it feel like it's life and death. It's not life and death. People, coaches versus cancer, uh, people who've been in that forever, especially Phil and, and Fran, Fran. There's, there's a lot more serious than basketball. But it really feels like when you dedicate most of your life to it and it's all riding on outcomes that sometimes you don't completely control. Yeah. So now I just have fun. I just have well, fun. When well, like I you said, now you're. Coach, I'm going to have fun. I'm not going to be sick to my stomach this weekend. Yeah, it's like great. It's like now you're, you're you know, you're the ultimate fan, but you're also, like you said, you're a subject matter expert. You're a person who knows, who knows what it's like to be in their shoes and has been in these situations, but you're also a, a fan of the game and you love the game. So it seems like a, a great place for you to be. It's a blast, Joe. You're totally yeah. right. Awesome. Well, I'll let you go. I'll let you catch the rest of that dating game. I'm actually interested in watching that too, because that's a big one in the A10 this year, in this yeah. in this crazy A10. So thanks a lot, John, for coming on. And uh, I really appreciate it. Joe, great podcast. I'm going to watch the other ones now. I could tell you're a diehard big five guy and you love college basketball in Philly. So anything I could do uh, to help, I will. And I can't wait to see your other guests. Awesome. I really appreciate that. Thanks a lot.